Hello, this is Vincent from Crackle Comics and uh, coming at you with some different content. I think this may be our second video on the channel that is not Crackle Comics Weekly. Uh, this is Vincent. I think I said that already. You may know me from my overly long haul segments and verbosity in uh, talking about random comics history and trivia. So today we're doing a haul video, which is going to be combining those two things. And this is primarily an order that I made with my comic shop, AKA Lone Star Comics. Um, when all this quarantine pandemic craziness started happening and lots of businesses were shutting down, it was kind of like, oh, you know, we can't go to that one convention, but I'll just make a huge my comic shop order and then I'll exercise my comic buying urges that way. But they actually ended up shutting down temporarily. And um, that was kind of a bummer. But it turns out they were back up. So I placed an order and this is what I picked up mostly from my comic shop. So, and also a lot of this, I'll just say a lot of this is inspired to some extent. Some of these things I picked up by some of the stuff that I watch comic book related on YouTube, first and foremost being cartoonist kayfabe from Jim Rugg and Ed Piskor. And on that note, here's a, here's a t-shirt that I was kind of, uh, got the heads up from them. This is from sisters in Christ. It's like a record late, uh, like a record store but they also do like bootleg Marvel shirts. Um, and so first I have two, two chunks of things that are not related, not from my comic shop order. So I'll show those off first. First we have uh, issues three through six of the Bubbles fanzine. Um, kind of a, gotten pretty hot right uh, recently. I mean, it's only up to six issues and covers all kinds of various Comics fun. There's a feature on Matt Fury and this, the creator Pepe the Frog. And uh, and then this one, six, books on Ben Mara. Uh, so those are, those are cool. I have one through two somewhere. I'm not actually sure where they are, though. Hopefully, I still do have a. Then also from not, not from my comic shop. And also actually I'll take the time to note here that I recorded this a diff, I attempted to record this and wanted to record this in a different format using kind of an overhead view so that you could get a better closer picture of some of the covers and the artwork and everything like that. You know, that's what makes sense for a comic book video, but I am a technologically inept slash don't have the proper equipment and experience. So it was just total failure. So we're doing it old school. We're doing it this way, the same way you see our hauls on Powerful Comics Weekly every week. And uh, you get to see my face. And I think it, for myself, especially without the experience doing it that way, it, it allows me to be a little bit more organized with my thoughts, even though it doesn't seem like that. All right, so now we have a run of Stark Future. And this is a 17 issue series. This is the whole series. They are uh, two, two, a, two to a bag. And this is an Aerosol series. Air, Aerosol was like an 80s publisher, primarily in the 80s. And it's basically like B-movie comics. Very like pretty, like have somewhat of an amateurish quality and lots of action or sci-fi or fantasy. Just kind of, you know, there's not a ton of substance to them, but they're fun. And... They're mostly known, I would say, for some of the artists that had little bits, little tenures there. So Gail Kuhn, before he jumped onto Hulk and eventually Pitt and everything like that, he drew some issues for Aerosol. And, and Aerosol is one of the companies that then gets absorbed by or purchased, joint, whatever, get absorbed into Malibu. Um, and I guess they kind of exist for a little bit and then they probably get their name gets used for an imprint and, and, and they're totally obscure now. Um, 
but this is Stark Future, which I think is like a kind of post-apocalyptic type of story, I think. I'm not even certain. But towards the end here, actually, I don't know how much the series, it could be the entire run, but these books inside have art by Stephen Hughes, who will go on to, pretty shortly after this, co-create with Brian Polito characters like Evil Ernie and Lady Death and found Chaos Comics and be basically their primary, their lead artist for up until he tragically passed away at a young age due to, uh, at a relatively young age due to cancer. And, um, you know, these are black and white books and you can kind of see, I think there's a good page towards the end here. It might not be this issue. You can kind of see on this cover, kind of see, you can stretch and make some Lady Death parallels. And uh, actually though, Air Cell, I don't think there's any really great examples here. I mean, this might actually be the closest, but this is not at all what I'm talking about. Air Cell had some Pretty cool, like airbrushed covers, essentially. I guess air, well, painted covers, things like that. So now we are into the My Comic Shop order. And since my unboxing style video totally failed, I will just point out that everything I'm going to show you came in uh, this box. They they pack things pretty well. And then every each chunk of issues, probably like every dozen issues or so, was also in a bag like this and then in the in the along the corners of the box there's probably i mean there might be a dozen in there of these these styrofoam corner things which um you know i'm sure work pretty decently keeping everything in the same spot and then it's topped with just a bunch of like Mean, uh, you know, like wrapping paper type stuff. So it's pretty secure. I mean, and they're all, they all, everything they sell, as far as I know, is bag and boarded. So, and I'm not a really, I'm not crazy about condition. Uh, so it's all, it's all, you know, I would recommend their service. So I've tried to split up this haul into a little different sections. But first, I want to show an, just a random interesting book. So this is. Let me actually take this out. This is Dark Sector Zero. Um, there were no further issues. It's just a one shot. If you're familiar with your slightly obscure last generation video games, Dark Sector was a game cross platform, I think, on 360 and PS3. And it's just like a pretty generic, pretty average action adventure type of game. But the gimmick is the main character has this kind of like boomerang type weapon, this lethal boomerang. But Top Cow did a licensed tie-in or I don't know if Top Cow licensed it or if whoever made uh, whoever made Dark Sector was like, hey, do this for us. You know, you know, it's hard to tell with some of these tie-in comics, but they did a one shot. And the thing of note here is the art, not just the cover. I mean, the cover you probably picked up, but the art inside by Bill Sienkiewicz, and it's quite interesting. And you know, this is pretty cheap. It was, you know, I don't think it sold well, but it was a mass-produced, you know, multimedia tie-in comic. So you can find this affordably. It's unlike, for example, Sienkiewicz's adaptation of Dune, which he did in the '80s, which is actually pretty expensive, which may partly be due to new Dune stuff coming up, but this is pretty interesting. It's definitely, definitely seems to be some kind of mixed media. Of course, this, you know, that glare that you can see is going to be great for this whole video, but it's some kind of mixed media. It's not really, you know, traditional some cabbage that, you know, back from back in the Moon Knight, uh, New Mutants days, of course. Next. Oh, we're already approaching 10 minutes. Next, we have Ghost Rider, Wolverine, Punisher, The Dark Design. And this is a quadruple fold-out cover. Doesn't really matter because the characters that matter are on the, you know, the main cover. 
And this is the sequel to the Ghost Rider, Wolverine, Punisher, Hearts of Darkness prestige one shot. And both of these pretty seamlessly fit or tie in with the Howard Mackey Ghost Rider run in the 90s, Danny Ketch. Both of them written by him. Hearts of Darkness was by John was drawn by John Romita Jr. And obviously, you know, kind of an it's not like a great story, but kind of an iconic and a pretty awesome looking 90s comic book. This one is art by Ron Garney. And it's also like Let's see, inks by Al Milgram, which is not super exciting. Colors by Palm Mounts, whatever. Um, I mean, Ron Garney's good. The art in here looks good. Um, but it's just not, I mean, you know, it's obviously not as exciting as Jeremy Jr. And honestly, like, I've seen better Ron Garney stuff for this era, like his earlier stuff on Daredevil. Um, and in fact, he was doing, he was doing one of the Midnight Suns books at this point. In fact, this may have been after that book was canceled. He did, I believe, Night Stalkers. Uh, yeah. So here we have the, a, the Morning Star special. And some of the things that I picked up are, or just actually, ultimately just a few of them, complete sets that, that will eventually end up in custom binds. And so the Morningstar special, this is a tie-in, a one-shot, uh, which is part of Bill Willingham's Elementals book, which was a superhero type of book with some adult attempted adult themes in the 80s from Kamiko. And in fact, we read, it may have been on the Students of S.H.I.E.L.D. channel, but we read a issue of Elementals at some point. And that's the final issue of Elementals that I need um, to complete what I intend to be the set. Now we have two, the one, the issues one and two, the only issues I've ever produced so far of non-player by Nate Simpson. And this is a big deal. Definitely worth tracking down. The, this is the number one is a second printing. So I don't, I'm not actually certain when the series originally, originally came out. And in fact, number one says of six. I don't know if that has since changed, but the second printing is from 2011 and you can already see on, on a little bit on page one that you know not well with the glare and everything but this series was a huge deal critically when it released i mean i, I don't think it sold amazingly but it was a big deal because the art in it is just fantastic you know very detailed very meticulous um painstaking and then became infamous as well because issue two came out, I think, in 2015. So like a four year later, and there hasn't been a third issue yet. Um, so this is a this is the famous double page splash that ends the first issue. And Nate Simpson, the creator, the writer, artist. He, I believe he works in film or, or I think video games as a day job and he's got a family as well. And I think he even may have suffered an injury or gotten sick at some point as well. So he kind of just works on it when he can and slowly charges long. At least I assume he's still doing that, still working on issue three, or maybe he's trying to bank them at this point so he can put more than one out with regularity. But obviously with only two issues out and the rest of it kind of uncertain. There's obviously not a trade paperback or anything like that yet. So definitely worth tracking down and not expensive at all. They may have been way back, but pretty affordable now. And here, my comic shop usually has a section of books that are available for a dollar. So I usually, you know, if I'm making a big order, I usually kick in a few of those that, that at least interest me to some extent. So here are two issues of Eight House Arc Light. And Eight House was this, like, I guess, meta series or imprint project by uh, writer, artist, creator Brandon Graham with a group of other creators. And they're different themes. I don't really, honestly, I don't really know anything about it. But I believe I actually have later issues, or maybe I have one of the other Eight House titles. So for a dollar each, you know, nothing wrong with that. And then I, had, I picked up Twisted Romance number two, which kind of similar concept. I believe Alex DeCampi 
curated or you know spearheaded this, which was an image miniseries focused on you know kind of romance stories and quirky stuff. Um, I mean, like classic romance, like in you know, which was a major genre in comics for a long time, but with a little bit of a twist, you know, because it's modern. And here, this was definitely a dollar issue. This, just for the hell of it, this is the variant for Southern Bastards number 10, the Jason Aaron and Jason Latour image comic book. And this was a variant, this is a circa 2015, that was produced to raise money to support certain organizations because this was when there was the whole controversy and conversa public conversation about Confederate flag and monuments and things like that. And then we have some, uh, let's see, let me slightly reorganize them. We've got some kind of shameless dollar pickups. So we have Operation Night Strike, number one. This is a uh, extreme comic book in the Rob Liefeld vein. There, there's a, that's Chapel. And I think over here in the corner, not very uh, emphasized, is Al Simmons. So this is kind of like a flashback to a lot of those characters when Image was still basically a shared universe. Here, this is kind of a mistake, to be honest. This is Glory number five. Um, and I'll talk about Glory more in a, in a second. But you can see in the corner, it's part of a crossover, Supreme Apocalypse part three of five. And I misread it and thought it was Extreme something part something or something. The Extreme Studios had like three, I believe, line line crossovers called Extreme Sacrifice, Extreme something. It may have been Extreme Apocalypse, one of them. And I thought this would be a you know a duplicate for that, but it's a smaller crossover with Supreme. But I might I don't know you know I'm not I'm not. It'll be in the collection in some way. Now this talk a little bit more about Glory. Obviously, this is a dollar issue. I don't know that I would remotely consider this otherwise. This is Evangeline Glory, and this is a chromium cover. Uh, it's a little wavy, too. I don't think this is the highest quality or, or most, uh, you know, intact chromium cover. And uh, so Glory, who I mentioned, is basically the Extreme Studios version of one Owen. It's, it's pretty explicit. And art by Mike Diodato, who had done some Wonder Woman. And then eventually there was an Alan Moore reboot of Glory with art by, I believe, Brandon Peterson, which was actually considered pretty good, but it only lasted like three issues, uh, similar to a lot of the Alan Moore, you know, late 90s stuff that got cut off. And there has been, and also like, I'm pretty sure Alan Moore's version of Glory, like heavily then inspired and transformed into his title Promethea for the America's Best Comics imprint through Wildstorm. And there has also been a really interesting modern reboot of Glory by Joe Keatinge and Sophie Campbell, which is definitely worth checking out. But Evangeline, on the other hand, is basically a similar concept, but I guess it's not really a Wonder Woman ripoff. I guess it's closer to like a Red Sonia or something like that. Um, just chick and vaguely religious. She's got a cross on her neck that was like a pattern with a lot of Liefeld characters. And Evangeline was not through Extreme. She was through Maximum Press, which this issue is published through, which was like Rob's other company in case for certain things that he didn't want through Image. It didn't really make sense. Like some of it was licensed, like they did Power Rangers comics and Battlestar Galactica comics. But I don't really understand it. And then eventually there was kind of some controversy between the image founders on, you know, what is, why does Maximum Press exist? What is Rob doing with it? How does his money work and everything like that? So Rob basically got, I mean, technically he quit, but he basically got kicked out of image and focused more on Maximum Press. 
And then that's where he, and then when Maximum Press falls apart, he evolves into Awesome Comics. And this is a title from Awesome Comics, Kaboom. And Awesome Comics what, uh, was also involving Jeff Loeb, whose credit is up here. And then eventually Awesome Comics failed as well. And then Liefeld had another company, a fourth independent company called Arcade Comics, which was very short-lived. And those comics are actually really hard to find because there's like a dumb gimmick where the, initially they were supposed to be only distributed at conventions. Like you couldn't order them and stuff like that. But Kaboom, I don't know. This is one of the few original titles origin, originating through Awesome. Art by Jeff Matsuda, who started with Rob Liefeld, I believe, on New Men before doing you know some Marvel work and, and things like that. And these were dollar books, obviously. So there's the dollar, or there's some of the dollar books. Here is Zorro Masters number one by American Mythology Productions, which is a very recent, very small publisher. And I guess they have the Zorro license to some extent. And the this, it was interesting to check out because this issue reprints stories that Alex Toth did for Zorro in, I believe, the 50s, maybe the 60s. Uh, from 1959, from the stories in here, originally from Dell's Four Color Comics, number 1003, 1959. And this material has been reprinted elsewhere. I think there's a Hermes Press book which reprints it pretty decently in color. Honestly, it might be the same files as this. And there were older image reprints, and, and some of it's in black and white, which honestly may be the optimal way because you can see sort of that the restoration here is not fantastic. You know, like if if this was DC or especially if Marvel for some reason somehow got those horror license and they reprinted this, it would look a lot better, but it's fine. And there's a certain appeal to it. Some people like it this way. Um, but interesting thing to check out and uh, a good taste tester too if, if you think you might be interested in going deeper with a reprint. And this was a dollar issue and this is very strange. This is the Cryptid Universe Preview. Got a very nondescript wraparound cover. And I have no idea what this is. It claims, so it's published through Thrill House Comics, but also involving Secret Lab Studios. And it seems that there was some kind of comic in development. We can see some layouts and or pencils here, but I don't really think it ever came out or maybe it did, I don't honestly know. But it seems that there was some kind of connection with a movie studio or a possible movie deal or video games or something like that, because you know this is like a a series bible. And there's also later on in here, there's reference to Weta Digital or Weta Workshop, I guess. But it's just weird. It was a dollar, and then there here's a pinup by Mike Mignola. Here's a piece by Frank Frazetta which seems odd. I don't know the origin of that. There's a Simon Bisley. And Alex Hor otherwise Alex Horley is a lot of this in here. So I don't know what this is. Probably have to do more research on it, but I thought it was, you know, for a dollar, weird little curiosity. Now, we've got a little image section. We've already seen some image stuff, but that was like shitty image stuff. First, we have, so you, you think this next one, you might think it's a shitty image, but really, I think everyone should check out this book. So this is Death Below number two, early Jim Lee, early Wildstorm. So obviously Jim Lee was doing Wildcats, but he also did Death Blow, which I think was the, this was the third Wildstorm title after Wildcats and Stormwatch. But what's interesting here 
is that Jim Lee was heavily inspired by Frank Miller and kind of went for a, I don't know how to describe art, um, a very shadowy, differently inked kind of style. And he's inking himself here, unlike Wildcats, where he's got Scott Williams. And very interesting book. And eventually, eventually on this series, you have, I believe, Tim Sale inking Jim Lee, which is a very interesting combo. And then you have Tim Sale taking art entirely. So the first like dozen or so issues of this, I would actually recommend just for the art, very interesting art. And this series was a flip book. And on the flip is Cybernary by Nick Manabat. It's weird because the cover is a flip, but then it's not actually a flip book. You can see this first page ad is upside down. These ads are upside down. It's not actually a, a legitimate flip book, but Nick Manabat, another reason to pick up these early uh, death blow issues, and, and in fact, not the trade, which doesn't include this stuff, is Nick Manabat, who just this crazy detail. I mean, it's, it's pretty dark, and with the other factors, it's, it's not going to show up well on the camera, but very detailed, manic, incredibly impressive, and very unique art style. Unfortunately, Manabat. Uh, had had some kind of illness and passed away at a, at a really young tragic age so he never really i mean it's not like he was ever really gonna you know draw superman number 705 or whatever but you know a lot of lost potential and, and it could have been a, a fantastic career and here we have savage dragon number 48 just just filling a hole in the early savage dragon run nothing to say there now this is interesting. This is what the number five, and this is in the image section because this is a very interesting issue. Obviously, it's kind of a, this is '90s. It's kind of a spinoff of Marvel's What If, but it, it ultimately is actually more of a, of a spiritual successor to the Silver Age title, Not Brand Eck. And in here, it's all parody stories. Um, you know, wacky, cartoony, but the big deal here is a lot of the image creators are in this. So here there's a Hulk story by Eric Larson, who of course did, I believe, one, yeah, he did one fill-in issue of the Grey Hulk during the Peter David run. And then later on, I believe there's two Jim Lee stories in here. There is a Larry Stroman story who goes on to do Tribe. Here's a little martial law parody. And there is a Wills Portaccio Thor story towards the end. And it's just interesting to see all, you know, a bunch of these image guys in one issue doing kind of doing a an anthology before image launches. You know, you can compare it to some of the anthology type issues that Image did, like Image Zero or Darker Image. And um, and also, th there's some interesting style stuff to pay attention to in that in the issue as well, because you have them going for a more cartoony look, which for Larry Stroman, you can kind of imagine it. But you, you don't, you know, you don't see Jim Lee pulling out that kind of style that often. Now this next stack, let's see, we've got some DC and some Valiant. So DC, first we have Wild Dog Special, number one. And this completes my Wild Dog collection, which of course is a very spare collection. There's a mini series, there's the special, and there are, there's one or two arcs across just a few issues in Action Comics Weekly, all by the creators, Max Allen Collins and Terry Beatty. And it's a character that really uh, fascinates me because he's got this incredibly bizarre and unique design with the hockey mask and the jersey. And he's like kind of the Punisher, but not quite as brutal and a little bit smarter. There's a lot more commentary, at least in the writing, not necessarily the character. And he's based in the Quad Cities, which is just the most bizarre, the most bizarre part, probably. Um, Wild Dog's cool, and I and I don't know the DC is ever going to reprint that, so I'll custom buy it and then 
when they reprint it, who knows. Now, similar, slightly political, here we have DC Universe Decisions. And this is a weird one shot from 2000, I think this is from 2008. And I don't really know the deal with this. I vaguely think that it's like, it has something to do with the actual in-universe continuity. It's obviously not quite as important and very different than what DC did in 2000 when Lex Luthor became president in the continuity. But we have stories here by Bill Willingham and Judd Winnick, which I think is interesting because both of those creators are a little bit known for their political views and their political treatment in their storytelling. So, and, and they're also kind of on opposite sides of the aisle. And Judd Winnick was writing Green Arrow at this point. And you can see there's Green Arrow on the cover. And this is obviously definitely, well, not obviously, this is definitely not collected alongside his Green Arrow. I'm not sure that it remotely needs to be. I don't even know if Green Arrow is in the comic, to be honest. But I think that was a dollar issue as well. So that was interesting to check out. Now this, this is Peter Cannon Thunderbolt number one by Dynamite. And this is the first Dynamite series, not the most recent one by Kieran Gillen. Now, why the hell did I buy this? And in fact, I actually own the, the trade that collects the whole series. This is a series that, this is one of, um, it's similar to Project Superpowers, which was done through Dynamite or Earth X and, and other books or Justice, other books like that, where it's basically Alex Ross handles the kind of general direction, the art direction. He does the main covers. This is not the Alex Ross cover but he calls in one of his buddies to help with this, the writing and the scripting. And usually, a lot of times it's Jim Kruger. In this is, instance, it's Steve Darnell, who Ross had previously collaborated on for the Vertigo take on Uncle Sam. And the interior art here is by Jonathan Lau. Uh, it's fine. It actually looks pretty good, I guess. you know, This is pretty much, it's a certain era of dynamite. This is pretty analogous to the early Green Hornet and Bionic Man and, and stuff like that. Um, it's, a, it's a fine story. It's whatever. But why should you buy issue one in the back issue bins? Here is the answer. It includes a special backup story. And this is a origin story for Peter Cannon by the original Silver Age creator, Peter Mar Pete Marisi. And this was a story that was commissioned by for, secret, for the DC series in the 80s, Secret Origins, but it never saw publishing for whatever reason. I don't, I think the series may have been canceled already or there was scheduling issues or something like that. So it never, it never saw print until in the back of this. And this is included in the trade. So if you're interested in Peter Cannon as a character in general, get that, but I'm going to pair this with DC's larger attempt at Peter Cannon, which was a couple years. I don't know when it was, but DC had like a dozen issue series in the nineties written and drawn, I believe by Mike Collins. And that's not getting reprinted because there are appearances by Batman and DC characters and things like that. And then Peter Cannon shows up in some issues of Justice League task force. So, this is custom, this is an issue that I'm going to rip in half to do some custom buying, and I'll note that um, there's some interesting, some actual editorial here too as well. Rather than just reprinting, you get a forward here by Mark Wade, who at the time was the editor of Secret Origins, who commissioned this uh, story originally. So that's kind of a a hidden gem that you would not know otherwise. Looking at the cover, you know, you're not going to. Expect some 60s style comics in there. Now, let's see if we can speed through some of the Valiant. So here's Ninjak, number one. Yes, number one. This is a Chromium cover by Super Glare by Joe Quesada and Jimmy Palmiotti. Then we have Bloodshot, number one. And I think, I guess this is also Chromium, but it's a, like a Chromium plate. Like, uh, you, like you could actually rip this off, similar to how they often do, I guess, hologram covers. I can't think of the right word. Um, so, yeah, two number ones. Here's Bloodshot number six. Nothing interesting there. Solar, Man of the Atom number one. 
Um, this is surprisingly not super expensive because, and part of that is that Solar, Magnus, and Turok were, you know, this is not Solar's first appearance because they were originally published through Dell and Gold Key in the Silver Age about, you know, about there. And Jim Shooter licensed the characters essentially to serve as a foundation for the Valiant universe um, before introducing original characters. And that's why today they're no longer, they're not with the current version of Valiant because of those licensing issues. Um, and they kind of float around from various publishers. And uh, but um, yeah, so I, and that, what I was trying to say is technically the second foundation because the initial foundation were licensed comics uh, featuring um, hmm, licensed comics. Yeah, okay, now I get it. Yeah, the, the initial foundation were for Valiant were licensed comics for Nintendo and WWF. So I opened this because um, it's kind of interesting. This is, you know, this is one of Valiant's very first issues, if not, you know, actually I think Magnus came first, but early on and you see Valiant's very unique coloring, which looked very different from Image, which technically was a little bit after this. Um, here's a double page splash. The art here in this issue is by Don Perlin, who by this point is actually, you know, kind of dated. But the other thing of note here is that in the first 10 issues of Solar, you also have a backup story, but it's not really a story. I believe it's only like one. I don't remember, but I don't remember the specifics, but you have a origin story told across the first 10 issues by Barry Windsor, written and drawn by Barry Windsor, or I think mostly drawn by Barry Windsor Smith. So then we have issues of Magnus, Robot Fighter. We've got five, seven, eight, 13, 14. Now the only thing I'll show is five because the second chunk of issues, the second arc or so, are flip books. So here's Magnus five, and here's Rye number one. And this is, effect, I guess it's Rye volume one or a Rye miniseries. I mean, no one really calls it that, even though it says Rye in it and it says number one, because there's a later Rye ongoing series that starts at number one. And this is a flip book, but it's, it's and this is an actual, um, yeah, this is an actual flip book. So here's Rye's cover straight up. Here's the first page of Rye. And then you flip it over, Magnus, first page of Magnus. So it does actually flip, unlike Death Blow Cybernary. But it, the two stories flow together. It's, it's basically a crossover in one issue or just a, an extended story. Unfortunately, where the two issues, where the two stories meet, it's a flip on a single page, at least in this issue. So you actually, you know, if you want to bind both of these, both Rye and Magnus, include this in both, you're going to need two copies. And this is pre-Unity Valiant, which means it's harder to find. Um, about the first dozen or less issues of several of their series are, take place before the, their major line-wide crossover, Unity, which introduced a couple of new titles and was really when they started getting a ton of buzz, when they started getting attention in Wizard and things like that. And that's when their sales went up, their print runs went up. But before that, some of them can be harder to find. And also before that is, you know, what's generally considered the good Valiant stuff. So that more reason that they're hard to find. And then at the very end of the runs, um, their sales drop and they, some of the issues can be hard to find. The last one or two issues of certain long running series. Here's Ryan number five. I thought this was a Quesada cover, but it might not actually be. I'm not certain, but it, this is a, I think this is one of the uh, best early Valiant covers. Here's an Exo Man of War number two. And this cover, you really get the vibe of how uh, he's kind of a mix of Iron Man and Conan, those kind of tropes. And then we've got some issues of Harbinger. And Harbin, so Solar number one, is not that expensive, but Harbinger number one is very expensive, pretty 
hard to track down affordably. So that's one of the value issues that I definitely still need. And so we've got Harbinger number three, four, 10, 14, and 41, which may be towards the end of the series. I'm not sure if it went way far than that. It may, it may have gone up to 60. So that's that. I know everyone watching, anyone who is watching, are big Valiant fans. And now ugh, our last stack, let me take a sip of water. I hope that showed up on the audio too. All right, so first we've got some dumb stuff. So I picked up some issues of the recent Cerebus one-shots. And these are very strange. They're Dave Sim taking, and I'm going to get the pronunciation wrong, Gustave, Gustave, Gustave Doré illustrations of essentially Dante's Inferno slash uh, the Divine Comedy and editing them into panel layouts, then Photoshopping existing drawings from throughout the 300 issues of Cerebus and then scripting and all the covers, most of the covers are parody things. It's very strange. So th this one isn't really a parody of anything. This is earlier on. And here we have two Sin City parodies. I think this one is also like, maybe this is like a Ronin thing, but the title is Sin City related, obviously Frank Miller. This is a giant size X-Men take. We got the uh, ASM 300. And then this, uh, for a second I was thinking Captain Canuck, especially with the Canadian imagery because Dave Sim is Canadian. But this is most definitely, especially with the trade dress, which is uh, the faux trade dress, which is supposed to look like first comics. This is definitely American flag number one. And that finishes that those obscurities that no one cares about, but the connection is American flag. Uh, you know, the 80s, fairly innovative first comic series by Howard Chaikin. So here is Iron Wolf number one, and this is a mid 80s DC comic. And this is a one shot which reprints some 70s stories created by Howard Chaikin, starring this character, Iron Wolf. And, you know, these are from the, these are from DC's like mid, mid late seventies fantasy books, sci-fi books. It's very bizarre, pseudo creator owned, but of course it's not creator owned. This is the 1970s. And this is one of the early characters where people often remark that Chaikin, a lot of his characters are basically the same character. And he just transports, you know, he, they, they, they look different, but he transports, you know, the setting and the, and the story and, and everything like that. But it's ultimately the same character with a similar attitude and has a lot of parallels with him. And here's a, fun, here's a funny kind of author photo on the back. But this, was, this is definitely, you know, if you're at all a Howard Chaikin fan, this is definitely worth tracking down. And this is pretty affordable because, you know, you're not going to, want to necessarily pick up like six to ten back issues from way earlier in the 70s just to get the six pages of chicken stories that are in them and then on that note here we have now this we're approaching the end these are a bunch of comic book related magazines for the most part and so here we have two issues of amazing heroes and both of these are Howard Chaikin Black Flag lead features. In fact, let's take this. So this is basically, I think this is basically the cover. Of, this is not the cover of Black Flag number one, um, but you can see, you know, you can see the parallels. And then we have an issue of Comics Interview with a Chaikin lead feature. The comics interview was a comic related magazine or fanzine, whatever, run by David Anthony Kraft, who is otherwise known for some writing. He had a run on the Defenders. And the, the cool thing about Amazing Heroes, unlike Comics Interview, is that these Amazing Heroes 
are comic book size. So you could actually, you know, if you're custom into custom binding, which I've referenced a few times on here, you can excerpt, you can cut pieces out of this and excerpt them. I mean, if you really cared, you could scan as much as you want from the magazine size stuff too, but you can cut this up, which I might do. And then here we have an Amazing Heroes issue with a lead feature focusing on Valiant. And then we have some issues of Wizard and some early ones. We have Wizard number three. This is, and then Wizard number four and Wizard number eight. And these first two, you, you can see not well that all three of these are still using the, you know, they're still using the wizard motif on the covers. And these first two are Bart Sears covers who did a lot of early image, uh, early wizard covers. Number three has a Simon Bisley interview. Number four has a John Byrne interview. Number eight has a Will Sportaccio interview to match the cover. And this is Bishop, which he co-created. So those are nice. And then here we have, I'm gonna take this one out. This is the, I need to replace this board. It's like sticking to the comic. This is the wizard special edition. And this is still very early on into the wizard run. And it is a, How many pieces is that? A four piece fold out with characters from all the image creators. And I think it is a jam piece. Uh, there's some weird picks. Rob Liefeld has three characters here and Jim Lee is only represented by Maul, you know, rather than like Grifter or Zealot or, you know, one of the more, I guess, more popular characters. Now, what is this? So you'd think it's like, heavily promo on image and it is like there's tons of image sections like uh, back here ah. back here you've got bios on on Liefeld, Silvestri but they're right next to bios on Frank Miller and John Byrne and you've also got there's here's a section on DC, like I don't, I guess this is a chronicle of a lot of publishers. Here you've got custom toys, custom figures, and here's a really cringy feature, the hottest women um, with some Psylocke, She-Hulk, Phoenix, you know, just garbage. I don't really know what the point of this is. It's, it's not really image promo, but it's not a regular issue of Wizard. Kind of bizarre, but I mean, really, you just you're getting it hopefully cheap for the cover, which of course is stupid, but that's what you do. And then, unlike that, we have two issues that are more what you would think that was. So here we have the Wizard beginning of the Valiant era special. And this one has the back is an ad just like that one. So this one only has double fold out. And this almost entirely is a bunch of Valiant junk. So here's a, some Archer and Armstrong bio and then a timeline. There's obviously a bunch of ads in here. Interviews with creators. There's like trivia questions, all kinds of garbage. But, and it says the beginning of Valiant era. And I guess maybe it's retroactively covering a lot of the early stuff but you can see they're advertising the crossover chaos effect. And this is, I, I've referenced Unity a couple times when I was going through the actual Valiant issue. And this is way past Unity. And uh, this is not the beginning of the Valiant period. This is kind of like the, they go on for a long time after this, but this is kind of like the downfall. This is when they start sucking. The issue also, the magazine, whatever you want to call it, also came with this Joe Quesada bookmark, which I don't think is super enticing. Um, uh, and then flash forward a couple of years, maybe almost a decade, 
we have the Wizard Special Edition for cross-gen. And likewise, profiles on some of the various series, covering some of the creators involved, things like that. And I'll just point out on the cover, you see some of the creators that were involved in early cross-gen to, to a certain extent, at least. George Perez, Bart Sears, Brandon Peterson, Mark Wade. Cross-gen's all right, too. And now our final thing, we're gonna go out a little bit on a bang to make this video hopefully under an hour. We have Wizard, it says free special edition. I have no idea if this was packed in with initial wizard or a comic or if it was mail away. I don't know how this worked, but this is the legacy of Spider-Man. And it's not very long, it's like 16 pages. And what this is, also, this is a great cover by Tim Sale. Um, it's one of those Spider-Man covers which really takes advantage of the colors of the costume and or lighting. And you can do some really striking things with that. Um, not really the same kind of vibe here, but obviously there's a there's a very acclaimed John Byrne cover from this from the black suit era, which kind of this reminds me of. So the concept here is that it's a bunch of pinups, and interestingly, there are pencils, no inks, no colors, by various creators, basically tributing or depicting seminal moments in Spider-Man history. So I'm gonna try and go through these relatively quickly, just cause it's interesting to point out the creators and things like that. And you're not really gonna see these very well at all, but, but track this down. I think this is actually a pretty cool thing for Spider-Man fans. So Daryl Banks, a uh, Green Lantern artist at this point, the, depicts the origin, uh, well, Amazing Fantasy 15, and he's chosen to show the Crusher Hogan wrestling fight. Then, Jim Calafior, who's working on Aquaman at this point, does these doc, the first Doc Ock appearance. Leonard Kirk, who's working on Supergirl at this point, I don't know why I'm holding it up, you can't really see. He does Sandman, that's pretty good, Sandman depiction. Now, the first very interesting one, Adam Warren, who's just credited for Dirty Pair at this point, I guess he hasn't created power yet, is depicts the lizard and then very interesting michael ringo who i think might be the only uh active spidey artist i keep showing the wrong this is a, this is a mess um michael ringo the only active spidey artist at this point on sensational spider-man does the looter and of course, he'd have another Spider-Man run later on in Friendly Neighborhood. Dan Jurgens, who's credited with for Superman and Thor, uh, does the unmasking by Norman of both Norman and Peter. And he, it's interesting that he's. I mean, it makes sense because concurrent. He's credited for Superman and Thor, but this is after he had a short run on some of the Spider-Man titles. And then here, the Black Widow is Tony Daniel, and a very interesting perspective piece. He's credited for the 10th, which we have covered on the retro. And then I think this is one of the most impressive one, is Doug Mankey credited for Major Bummers and Superman Man of Steel depicting the Hulk. And his Hulk, which you're not going to be able to see very well, is really ripped. Uh, you know, very veiny, that kind of style of Hulk. Then Carlos Pacheco does Death of Gwen Stacy. Jim Ballant does Man Wolf. And I think this is one of the more impressive and unique ones as well. And Ron Lim, I feel like this is kind of Oh, and Balance is still credited for Catwoman, which we've discussed on various shows. Now, Ron Lim, who's credited for J2, which is the MC2 Son of the Juggernaut title. Very strange. Um, he depicts Marvel 2-in-1 Annual Number 2, which was like part of a whole Avengers crossover with Thanos. I feel like that's kind of a stretch putting it in 
a major moment for Spider-Man. Maybe they just let the artists pick their, you know, their choice completely because at a certain level, it does make sense because Ron Lim associated with that cosmic realm with characters like Silver Surfer, Infinity Gauntlet. Chris Bacello, also another sl uh, slightly less um, off the beaten path pick. He goes with the Savage Land arc from Marvel Fanfare. And he, he'll do some Spider-Man later. I don't know that he's touched the character yet at this point. And Mark Bagley does Nothing Can Stop the Juggernaut. Of course, he's a Spider-Man legend. This is a, this is several this is a couple of years, maybe one or two years away from all, the Ultimate Universe and Ultimate Spider-Man. Walter McDaniel, who I feel like I don't I don't know where what happened to him. He may have switched careers or something because you don't really hear about him that much anymore. He's credited with Deadpool at this point. I think that's the Christopher Priest run, maybe. He's got the Hobgoblin. And then Sean Chen, credited for Iron Man, does Craven's Last Hunt. And then the final one, which is interesting on multiple levels. Number one, the final pick, the final moment is Venom, Amazing Spider-Man 300. Which is interesting because this is like 1999 probably, and that's what they're considering the final moment or the you know the last major moment. And again, it may be that artists just weren't super interested in this is 1998. Maybe that they weren't super interested in doing some of the other stuff, but they could have done Carnage. They could have done. I mean, they they probably don't want to, but they could have done stuff like Invasion of the Spider Slayers and the Fake Parents, and then there's obviously the Clone Saga. Um, you know, elephant in the room. But the most interesting part is that this final piece is done by Humberto Ramos, who will become pretty shortly after this, you know, a, a Spider-Man artist and a pretty prolific one. And at this point, and he and he'll do an arc or two related to Venom. And at this point, he's credited for Crimson, which then which was one of the titles um, in Wildstorm's cliffhanger imprint, um, which also included Joe Madera's Battle Chasers and J. Scott Campbell's Danger Girl, which is then interesting because this ad for Wizard number 88 on the next page includes a spotlight on Joe Mad's Battle Chasers. And then to give more of a perspective on when this is and what's going on with Spidey, there's an ad on the back cover for Spider-Man Chapter One, which it's possible that this, you know, was is kind of considered a slight tie-in to that, which is kind of ironic, because of course Chapter One, uh, written and drawn by John Byrne, is an attempted redo of the origin and is a total mess, um, very disliked by Spidey fans. So if you're a Spider-Man fan, I would definitely check this out. I mean, you can get it pretty cheap. Um, I mean, it's not like it, it says free on the cover. So originally it was free and it's like 16 pages or whatever, but it, it's pretty cool little uh, thing for collecting. So that's basically everything here. That's a whole My Comic Shop order plus some extras. Fun to have this, fun to go through this during quarantine and also Hooch and Bindery, who I do most of my custom comic book binding through, are officially open again after they close for a little bit. So hopefully getting a package out their way, and then you know, I'm not going to get the books for a while. But that's exciting. Probably not going to be any cons this year, at least the ones that I go to traditionally. So, uh, you know, you got to find the fun where you can. And I will thank anyone who sat through all this. And... Uh, Catch us on Crackle Comics Weekly every week, talking about new comics, old comics. Look out for other content on this channel. And thanks for watching. Have a good night. It's under an hour.